of Energy of the Province of Santa Fe, Forbes Walker University of Tennessee, and the moderator is Sebastian Bravo. Thank you. We will share with you the approaches from uh, international and national speakers. Very important to understand the global and strategic development. First of all, Andres will touch on the oil uh, business and raw material business. He will talk about the demand and the opportunity to attract uh, a very interesting business. The second, by sustainability and energy. Dan will touch on the importance on how to produce certifications and the need of our customers to understand the processes and how we take care of the environment. Then Veronica will talk about a joint action, public policies of the province of Santa Fe and in articulation with the private sector in the development of uh, biofuels. And Forbes will share cover uh, crops and the effect of cover crops on the soil. You are familiar with the commitment of new seed for aggregating added value in the chain. And we have always understood that everything is connected. We look beyond yields and we think about uh, productive systems that have agricultural and economic um, um, results with sustainable uh, impact over the time. For the time being, we have covered 94,000 hectares in Argentina and 10,000 hectares in Uruguay of a new crop gener uh, using um, hybrid um, generation to be used in aircraft fuel with green has uh, greenhouse gas effect. And together with Uruguay, we have shared our experience to start producing these fuel in Brazil, Paraguay, Spain, and France. The trend for the supply is global. We have a huge opportunity to capture our value in our current productive systems. So from new seed, we are promoting carbon uh, bonds for this season, 2024 and 2025. We recognize or give $2,000 to each farmer. So without further ado, I welcome Andres. Thank you. It's my honor to be part of such a distinguished panel, and I hope that we can convey our enthusiasm with regard to cover crops and um, the huge opportunity that we see in Argentina. Con estos gráficos. So these are some charts published by The Economist a couple of months ago because they speak for themselves. We see global warming accelerating and it's quite clear that this is due to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Public policies all over the world in the developed world aim at electrifying the um, power grid. But there are, in certain cases, that is more difficult, particularly with SAF, uh, SAF right? Uh, this has been prepared by Ayatas, and it's the forecast for um, aviation fuel in the next years. The light blue shows fossil fuels that consumption should start reducing uh, now. Then darker blue is basically SAF. The darker blue is the method. There is a difference between the two methods. Uh, the gray area is PTL, power to liquid, or uh, power to liquid, which is the opposite of uh, what thermal plants do uh, to produce uh, electricity. We would be using a sustainable electricity, let's say solar, wind, energy, to produce a liquid capturing CO2 in the atmosphere. 
but this technology is in its infancy. It's very expensive, and we need to multiply the quantity of windmills and farms to attract solar um, energy. And it should replace city uh, and industry electricity. That is going to be the limiting factor, the uh, production of sustainable electricity. And the green area is hydrogen and the orange is batteries. There are some aircraft prototypes using this type of electric batteries, but for very short flights. It has to do with the weight of the batteries. That is the disadvantage, basically. As I mentioned before, SAF, there are two pathways, the uh, HEFA, hydro-treated esters and fatty acids, and ATJ, alcohol to jet, which is ethanol-based. It's more developed as an industry, but uh, HFA is the leading technology, let's say. That means the use of esters and fatty acids. And this chart was published by a consultant. This is just to give you a, an overview, right? All biofuels um, from esters and fatty acids, including biodiesels, renewable diesel, HBO, uh, 65 million approximately. And in the next 20 years, SAF alone will need 300 million tons. This is just to give you an idea. It's four times more what is currently being used. And biofuels for land transportation will continue an uptrend. But electrification probably will take the lead in the countries that do have the infrastructure. Because in Argentina, we do not have electricity generation and uh, production. So in Argentina, uh, having the type of uh, grid that we have today, it's like uh, dreaming. SAF adoption will be will vary depending on the region. The U.S. and Europe will uh, be leading the use, while African Latin America will follow suit or be very at the end. Brazil has a SAF public policy as of 2027, but which will become effective in 2027. So we are lagging behind in the use of these type of uh, energies. The demand of esters, not only for the SAF, but also for the automotive industry, has two main impacts, a positive one and a negative one. Positive is the huge opportunity to be part of this increasing market, particularly in the United States. Uh, many have participated in the EPA soybean program. The oils uh, are exported to the United States as bi uh, biodiesel, uh, and they are triangle in Europe that turns it into biodiesel and then it gets into the United States. But it's a huge opportunity for agricultural uh, farmers in Argentina and for our industry that is gaining access to a new market. But on the other side, there is an important and major negative impact. The increasing uh, demand for this type of oils in the United States resulted in a huge grinding capacity in the United States and Canada. Approximately the increase uh, accounts for 32, 33%. Grinding plants will sell the oil in the United States, but uh, the crushing, uh, but the protein meal will not follow and they will uh, sell it cheap and uh, as a result of that, 
the price will be down because most uh, the demand for proteins in China, the Southeast Asia, is going to level off and it's going to be a price depressor and also for soybean because uh, nine months throughout the year, the industry in Argentina pays uh, soybean more than what exporters can pay. And they crash at a variable uh, price. So we cannot absorb the, uh, the price of meal. The only way is to stop the plant. So that is a major threat for farmers, for crushers, and uh, in order to protect the value of the chain, uh, diversification is very important. Uh, using traditional, like for example, uh, rape oil and sunflower that have more oil and less protein, and cover crops uh, as we are talking now. All these type of crops that we mentioned before that have a high content of oil. So there are specific raw materials for SAF. Depending on the destination, the country of destination for that fuel or the raw material for the fuel, there are different requirements to be met. For example, in Europe, First of all, they do not compete with human or animal uh, feeding. They do not produce changes in the use of soil, that is to say, uh, deforestation. And to be sustainable from a financial, environmental, and social point of view. In Argentina, we say there are 28 million hectares of summer crops and only 8 million hectares for winter crops, which is uh, wheat and soybean, and we, um, wheat and barley, he corrects himself. The idea is not to outplace them, but to attract some of these hectares that are for um, farro or other or use other crops and replace them partly with these cover crops that are to s profitable to a certain extent. Um, destination countries want uh, that we use waste, but the issue is availability. In uh, 20 years, we need three mil 300 million tolls. Used cooking oil is impossible. We don't get uh, to that volume. Animal fat, impossible. It's just a very uh, little portion of what we need for SAF in the future. So cover crops account for the largest portion. We see this as a huge opportunity for Argentina, thinking in the European destinations while other countries develop their uh, laws. And, uh, and the United States is a different case because a soybean oil can be used from American origin as long as certain uh, sustainability conditions are met, direct uh, seeding and cover crops in winters that cannot be harvested. Well, these are the two conditions, not to add carbon to the soil, uh, etc. Was prepared by a consultant, the sources ICF, and in five or six years' time, there will be a gap between supply and demand, a big gap. And of course, we have to grow and quickly because the demand will be there, and we should see it in the prices, in the pricing. Today, what is being used is being used on a voluntary basis by some airlines, but starting next year, it will become mandatory to present in Europe, US, 
they will start with 2% to 2% in the US. So this will grow quickly and there will be an increased demand and the prices will grow too. Talking, of, talking about cover crops again, we have the issue, the theme of regenerative agriculture. The focus is not on, on emissions, but on the soil health, that is to improve the soil quality. And fast forward here, you can see the advantages, resilience vis-a-vis, -vis, resilience vis-a-vis, weather events, better yields, and which are the most important tools used to keep the soil covered. This is done in Argentina. Almost everybody uses a non-till approach. No plowing. This is the Embracid Congress. Crop rotation, limited use of organic fertilizers, and a wider use of biofertilizers. In Argentina, we use very small amounts of organic fertilizers for economic reasons. We do most of these things. What we don't do, and while there is an opportunity to develop carbon bonds, is what we have on the right. Increase crops diversity and keep live roots in the soil. And those two go together, so to say. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hola. Gracias, Sebastián. He prometido compartir algunas palabras en español. Thank you, Sebastián. I promise to start in Spanish, but after that, I will switch to English. I have to read what I want to say. I'm really glad to be here with so many people who already understand the importance of integrating the ideas of sustainable development to agriculture. Besides, you all know that together we will be able to contribute with agricultural solutions that tackle climate change all over the world and in a very important and significant fashion. New Seed is an innovative company worldwide in the agricultural sector, which enables farmers to turn some crops into sources of renewable energy with low carbon uh, production. We use the value of crops such as canola, carnata, sorghum, sunflower, and sugarcane to offer solutions and value beyond the yields. Well, today I will talk about some, I will share some ideas to tell you how we can achieve all this while we build and strengthen the growth of new markets driven by funding and agreements such as the Paris Agreement of 2015, the UN Agreement. Several organizations, global organizations, have committed, have made a commitment to becoming carbon neutral. And all of us here, our, our products here, enable farmers and end consumers, such as airlines and consumers, to quickly adopt new technologies so as to meet the current demand and the future demand coming from future generations. Well, bien. Hola. A few facts that I, I think, given what we've already heard from Andres, are very important here. First of all, global climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. I think we all agree on that, and there's no longer any, any argument there. But where, who's the problem and who's the solution? So first off, fossil fuels, we all know, 
75% of all greenhouse gases in the atmosphere come from fossil fuels. The transportation sector, the transportation sector is one third of all greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 90% of transportation fuel emissions come from agriculture. Sorry, from, from fossil fuels, <laughs> sorry. Now, with the transport sector responsible for that, we have some solutions and we have some solutions that are very economical, right? Electrification is one of those. But as we already heard, first of all, electrification depends on having a renewable energy infrastructure. It also depends on being able to use electricity for whatever that mobility purpose is. So in transportation, yeah, we can have light duty vehicles and passenger cars running on electricity, but that's not going to work for heavy duty transportation, heavy duty trucks, long distance transportation, rail, aviation, maritime, all of these industries, all of these sectors of transportation will rely on liquid fuels for many years to come, for decades. The only solutions we have available to decarbonize that transportation sector is liquid fuels that are coming from biological sources, plants, okay? So that long distance is the only solution we have. Getting there, we need all solutions on the table, all crops, whether it's ethanol, whether it's uh, oil, small oil seeds like carinata, camelina, in order to achieve any emission reductions, if what we've accomplished as a, as a, as a globally, what we've committed to achieving is emission reductions that are way beyond the capabilities we have today. We could now reduce emissions in some small way for zero dollars or negative dollars, right? We can change some light bulbs, but we won't accomplish very much. In order to accomplish the change that we need, the costs are going to be borne by some part of society. So who's going to pay and how are we going to accomplish that? It must be the case that if we're going to accomplish the investment, if we're going to find the investment in the products that we need to use, the end users need to begin to pony up, need to bring that investment forward in order for us to provide it. And we think about the theme, la tema de, de hoy, del uh, Congreso, is todo es conectado, everything is connected. So how do we get that investment from the end customers, whether it's the, the airlines or the Microsofts and the Googles who are using all of this energy back to the beginning of the supply chain where it begins, where we're using regenerative agricultural practices, we're sequestering carbon in the soil, and these are the things that ultimately are giving us the opportunity to reduce emissions from all of transportation, especially those that are the most carbon intensive today. Sustainable aviation fuel. This is one, but not all, of, of how, the, how it will be achieved. In the European Union, we already have a very clear trajectory, very cre clear growing demand for sustainable aviation fuel. Chemically, physically, it's exactly the same as fossil-based. And it comes from many sources. Cooking oil is one, waste oil is another, but it is all, these are all very, very limited. So the extent to which they will provide solutions is nowhere near what is needed in the long term. Purpose-grown crops, plant oils, that is where agriculture becomes not part of the problem contributing to climate change, but agriculture becomes part of the solution. Thinking about some of the opportunities that are out there, some of the feedstocks that exist, Brasca carinata, carinata is all the way on the right-hand side. In order to mix any of these biofuels with traditional fuels by blending in an aviation fuel or maritime, what we're looking for is the lowest possible carbon intensity we can accomplish. With cover crops like carinata, we're doing that by sequestering carbon in the soil, by having zero impact on land use change, and at the same time, we're bringing all of the traditional input trait solutions, all of the grower and agronomic benefits that we're already familiar with, that we know cover crops can deliver. And on top of that, we're adding the end use consumer benefits at the downstream end of the life cycle associated with the fuels themselves. Not worth spending much time here. I know we're limited in time. The, the, the agronomic benefits of cover crops and carinata in, in specifically are, are many. As a contract cover crop, we're adding revenue to the agricultural producers, so it's an extra source of income that didn't exist before, 
and we're bringing all of these agronomic benefits. One of the most important things for us at New Seed to be able to demonstrate to the end use customer is the sustainability associated with the life cycle. So the production, the cultivation, the, the harvest, the, the crush, the transportation, the refining, all of that is in our proprietary model following a fully traceable supply chain. Transparency, being able to demonstrate to our customers that the carbon intensity of the, the unit volume of fuel that you have purchased comes from a particular source, comes from Argentina. We can tell you the lot and we can tell you what's associated with that, the carbon intensity of a particular farm, of a particular footprint. And that is where we need to be able to bring, bring the credibility and assign the value. And it's not only greenhouse gas emissions either. I will leave you with this. I think it's very important to understand that when we're talking about the sustainability that we can offer, that agriculture, that the sector can offer to transportation, to the energy industry, to bioenergy in general, it's not just greenhouse gases. The value beyond yield, value beyond greenhouse gases is also in how we manage water, how we manage soil, the land use change, social factors, safety and health factors. All of these things need to be considered. And when we're thinking about the companies, those, the, the Microsofts and the Googles that I'm talking about earlier, those are the same companies that are willing to pay and must be part of the investment in the full sustainability life cycle and also have made these commitments and have made these commitments to labor rights, to legality, as well as to greenhouse gas emissions. So I'll leave you with that. The opportunity is vast. It's huge. Uh, here in Argentina, we have, what, something like 28, 30 million hectares of uh, agricultural land available to us, even if only one small piece of that is adopted into cover crops in Carinata and other similar crops. It is a significant opportunity to decarbonize transportation. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Dan. Excelente presentación, Verónica. Thank you, Dan, for your outstanding presentation, Verónica. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, New Seed, for inviting me to become part of this panel. I don't have a presentation because the take-home message of my presentation is just one statement. Santa Fe will produce SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuel. I come from Santa Fe. I represent the government of this province, and for many years we have believed in our productive system and our governor, Mr. Pujano, has as a main goal the support of the Santa Fe of Santa Fe's production system so that it may reach its full potential following the example of production, hard work, Argentina may move forward and Argentina will be move forward with more development, more added value, especially from inland Argentina. I come from Esperanza, the first agricultural village organized in Argentina. The first family that made it to that village was my family, the Mering family. And this is just to show you that we, that in our blood we have farming production. And we also developed the first mills of built the first bill, uh, sorry, mills in Esperanza. So we really trust the production from the Santa Fe province. So seeing all the potential, all those lessons to be, that have been learned throughout this, these hundred, hundreds of years in the province of Santa Fe and looking at all the data, we may really show that Santa Fe has a full potential to grow and to add value to to go into this world, adding value to the world of energy, because I'm the energy secretary. I'm not the agriculture secretary. We have the agriculture and cattle meeting secretary of the province here, too. But how do we work together? Well, because Santa Fe has uh, besides working in the area of traditional biofuels, which represent the biggest share of our productive matrix. In Santa Fe, we have 82% of the installed capacity of biodiesel, where the main production 
province for biofuel. We also produce biogas and bioethanol. So companies such as Nucid are making progress in the province, and they are introducing these paradigm changes with new crops in order to move into this world of energy, which is so important for sustainable sustainability. Because if there's a change in en in the energy matrix, well, this will enable us to achieve the goals Argentina has set for itself, the commitments it has made internationally. But the internationally, these are commitments. But this is also a need, because the world is asking for sustainable goods, sustainable products. And for this, energy com the energy component where the energy footprint, the carbon footprint is mentioned, is very important. Let's think of this figure. I haven't achieved it yet. But let's think or let's imagine that everything we, in all the cases where we use fuel oil today in Argentina for primary production, instead of fuel oil, we would be using biodiesel. It would be. This would reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions significantly. Anyway, this would be an excellent way of starting to move along the path of sustainability. So Santa Fe is also part of the group of bioenergy promises. We are, have drafted a bill so there is more biofuel in, the ener in Argentina's energy matrix. In the world of biofuels, SAF means a large added value, and we want to have the first facility to produce SAF in Santa Fe. So one of the first executive degrees decreased by our governor was a decree, executive decree, where he stated that uh, SAF production in the province is a priority for our province. So by organizing private public partnerships. We want to set up the first facility, starting with the oil path. We trust the oil path because we are close to the ports, and we could export this added value product, which would mean a higher hard currency income for Argentina. So with this goal that has been set by our province and based on concrete steps that have been taken. We believe this is the value our province may add, which considers the private and the public sector working together. We manage the province and we merge the interests of both parts, of both sectors that won't be working together easily. Otherwise, so with a change of paradigm, while well, things don't happen naturally, but there is something that drives these changes and has them come true. This started with the beginning, from the very beginning, with biofuels, which where the government sets up the stakeholders, drives them and invites them, creates incentives or penalties to achieve the goal of adding value, which is what we need in our country. So thank you very much. I'm not going to take much longer because I believe there will be a Q&A session. But thank you for this opportunity of showcasing and telling you that Santa Fe will be producing SAF. Thank you for your words. And we now invite the next speaker. Thank you very much. My name is um, um, so a lot of the talks here are things that I'm learning about. Um, so I work at the University of Tennessee. Uh, University of Tennessee, uh, like Argentina, we have a lot of no-till. We have a lot of uh, work that has been done on cover crops. And uh, the future looks very, very bright for cover crops and the switch to these oilseed crops. So I want to give a, a, an impression of what's going on in, in the United States. So just a little bit about Tennessee agriculture. We are the, in the southeast. You see our state in the southeast. Uh, we have about 1,200 millimeters of rainfall, so similar to what you have here. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> mostly frost-free days, but we do get frosts in the wintertime, which is an issue for some of the uh, oilseed crops that we might want to grow. 
uh, we have a lot of farms, uh, 63,000 farms, uh, covering um, you know, over 4 million hectares, much smaller than the land base here in Argentina, but still very important for the economy of Tennessee. Uh, we are a cattle producing state. We grow a lot of poultry, like you do as well. And uh, we grow the, crop, the same crops as you do in the same kind of rotation. So we grow soybeans, we grow maize, uh, we grow winter wheat in typical rotations to use here, as well as um, cotton. The, the value of our, our cropping systems are about $2 billion per year to the state of Tennessee. So it's a very important industry for us. Um, just a little bit about no-till adoption. We're at the Apreseed Conference. I, we need to mention that uh, uh, we've done a lot of no-till. This is our state uh, in the big red circle. We are the uh, state with the highest rate of adoption in the United States. We're at 93%. We've been working on this since the 70s, and so it's something that we're quite proud of. Uh, you can see the, uh, in the western part of our state near the Mississippi River in Memphis. That's where, all we, where we grow all our, our crops, basically. And that's where we have all our no-till. But there are many s s crops uh, it's close to us that are also growing, uh, doing a lot of no-till as well. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about cover crops. So, you know, cover crops are crops that we typically grow in the winter months after the main cash crop. And uh, important things are obviously for pro providing soil protection, less soil erosion, and uh, improvement of the, the, the soils between the, the, the main cropping periods. Uh, this slide here shows typically what we're doing. If you look at the uh, left-hand side, we will grow a, a winter cover crop. Typically for us, it's uh, wheat, uh, maybe some legumes like clover or vetch, as well as some brassicas. Typically, we're terminating or killing the crop before we plant the, uh, uh, the, 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 the main crop. The big thing is to keep the soil covered at all times and uh, in reduce erosion rates and other benefits. I was asked to... Um, I was asked to give some benefits of cover crops. I could talk for hours on this subject, uh, but this is one slide. This is 40 or 50 years of worth of work from many researchers. Uh, we know cover crops control erosion. That was the number one reason why we started them. Uh, we know we can increase the amount of carbon. That's really important for the soil biology. Uh, we know we can increase the wet aggregate stability, which is the ability of the, the soil to maintain its structure in intensive rain events, very important. If we've got leguminous crops in the, in the system, we know we've got more nitrogen. Uh, we know we have better infiltration in uh, no-till cotton systems, um, as well as in the tillage systems, although we don't have much tillage. Weed suppression is another important thing. We have a lot of resistant weeds. Uh, cover crops are becoming a tool to manage some of these resistant weeds. We know there's great changes in soil biology and in uh, uh, soil health. And we know that we improve our yields and our extreme conditions. Uh, climate change, we recognize more floods, more droughts. We see higher yields when we've got cover crops in the system. This is a, a photograph from 2017 statistics to show the uh, adoption of cover crops um, in the United States. Uh, you can see the uh, um, colors in the yellows and in the oranges and the reds. That's where we see most of our cover crop adoption. You'll notice the... Uh, a lot of the cover crops in the far eastern part, that's to do with the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, and lots of incentive programs to get farmers to grow that. Uh, best I can guess, our cover crop adoption in Tennessee the last year was about 20%. That's just combining the acreages we have for our wheat as well as uh, cover crops. So we're improving since this 2017 number. Uh, we're at, I think, some of the highest rates of cover crop adoption but we're still a long way from 100%. <laughs> um, now let's talk about sustainable aviation fuel. I've been talking about this for the, the last six, seven, eight months. Prior to this, I really didn't know very much about this subject, but uh, as uh, you, has been mentioned, we have this, uh, um, uh, this, gr this grand challenge. Our departments of energy, departments of transport, and our departments of uh, uh, agriculture have this memorandum of understanding. Uh, the numbers they are talking about are enormous. So the global aviation industry says that they've got certain goals, initial goals by 2030, and then by 2050, 100% of the aviation fuel from alternative, from, from, from basically from, from, uh, from crops. And uh, if you look at the numbers we um, are trying to supply uh, by 2030, 
3 billion gallons or 11.3 billion liters of aviation fuel. Moving this on to the next 50 years, we're looking at over 110 billion liters. So an enormous drump, jump in that next 20 years. So uh, the numbers are astonishing. And how we're going to get there is what we're, we're talking about. Um, the um, um, Department of Energy has a, a, a bioenergy technologies office. And uh, this is some of their thoughts. Their thoughts are uh, that we'll initially start with the, as was mentioned early on, with the, the maize to ethanol or the, uh, uh, the route, and then going on to jet fuel there. That's a more complicated, more expensive route. But ultimately, we're looking at uh, producing biomass from uh, different sources. This map here um, shows a map of the United States. For the western part of the United States, they're looking at uh, biomass, from woody biomass, from basically from trees. Uh, in the eastern part of the United States, where we're basically growing a lot of the crops, this is where we're talking about growing, uh, no longer just growing cover crops, but growing oilseed crops to replace those cover crops in a, in a double cropping system. Uh, we have a potential uh, for, uh, you know, to produce, uh, we're going to need at least 10 million hectares to produce this 11 billion liters. Uh, I haven't talked about it here, but there is a report that uh, the U United States just came out with where they will be looking for a billion tons of biomass per year, whether it's biomass from, from trees and woody plants, from crop residues, and from oil seeds. So that's a very large thing. The, the numbers look like you know, the United States may be able to reach the targets to be self-sufficient, but it's still going to be a very, very uh, long stretch and a lot of uh, work ahead of us. What have we done in Tennessee? So uh, in Tennessee, uh, we're looking at this 2030 uh, target. We know initially it's going to be converting the, uh, the corn, the maize, into ethanol. After 2030, we really have to start uh, increasing our production of the oilseed crops. Uh, we know that we've got the genetics for producing canola. Uh, we know how to grow canola. We do not grow canola in Tennessee because we don't have the infrastructure to crush the, 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 the seeds. And uh, you in Argentina have got a great advantage in that you already got that infrastructure in place. You can crush the seeds. Our, our soybeans are basically exported as soybeans to China, and that's all we do. So we don't, we've got no inf infrastructure in place. Other question is, do we have the genetics? And we've tried different, uh, uh, different crops. Uh, the other thing is, not only do we have the genetics, especially the genetics to fit into a, a short-growing crop, but also a crop that will survive winter frosts is really important for us. And getting that to fit into our um, um, current cropping system. So this is where um, we are at the moment. I think we, um, we're doing a lot of work looking at where we might uh, put our uh, processing systems. We still haven't really started talking about how we might integrate the uh, after we've crushed the, the seed, the meal into our livestock systems, our beef cattle, our poultry, and our swine. And I think the big thing is we really need to partner and collaborate. I think we, we know things, we've got systems in place that may be of benefit to you, as well as you guys have got a lot of experience in this that we do not have. The genetics, I think, is going to be a critical thing. You know, whether we're going to be uh, growing camelina or carinata, if you can get some... Uh, uh, frost-resistant uh, materials, that would be really helpful for us. But uh, I guess I, I throw the gauntlet out. We'd uh, really like to collaborate with you and partner with you. I, I think we aren't actually um, competitors in this area. I think we're, we need to learn together and help reach these very, very ambitious goals. And with that, I think I've ended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eh, nos quedan algunos minutos. Eh, tengo ya algunas preguntas que nos han llegado. We have some minutes left. There are some questions here. Please be brief when you answer them so that we may, may answer most of the questions. Andres, this is a question for you first. The opportunity for Argentina is to sell the raw materials for the new biofuels or to produce them locally and exp export as SAF. Well, this will depend on the buying markets. As you know, we ha there, is, there are anti-dumping and anti-subsidy regulations in Europe and the US for biodiesel. And the definition of biodiesel is not specifically 
biodiesel as esterification of fatty acids, but it's a w very wide definition. I talked to the lawyers who are managing this for us in the US and in Europe, and they told me, well, for HBO, well, I believe it's difficult because it is a substitute for biodiesel. In the case of SAF, there is some hope, but we have to negotiate for this. I believe politics play a key role here because if the buying markets prevent us from sending our product there, the best way of overcoming these barriers is through political agreements. Jan, we have a question for you here. Absolutely, there is, uh, I'd say, the opportunity for a much bigger biofuel market in Argentina than we already have, although, of course, a biofuel and biodiesel market already exists in Argentina. As we're looking towards the markets that are most building the demand internationally, I think the opportunity in front of us here in Argentina is to leverage the capacity that already exists to crush capacity here in Argentina, as we already heard, it's, uh, it, it is for me a no-brainer. It absolutely needs to become part of the way that we're doing business here in order to enter the markets that are becoming much more important for the oil seeds that will grow here, uh, both in the United States, North America, and also in the EU. Thank you. Um, Veronica? Veronica, this is a question for you. Which are the challenges you face when you talk about manufacturing or producing SAF today? Well, these events like this, this one is very important, where we share ideas. I congratulate you for organizing this meeting, because first of all, energy has to be part of the public discussions, agriculture, cattle breeding, should, those sectors should be part of these discussions. So these themes should not be managed just by one sector, by techni technical people, by the academia. This should be part of the public agenda. It's the industries that are going to benefit from these developments. These are the ones that should talk about this. So first of all, they should take this subject subject matter to the public agenda. There is a second uh, challenge, which is the technology pathway that will be used. This is related to raw materials, whether the world is really moving towards achieving the global decarbonization goals. And nothing of what we have today will be enough. And some of the things we say will not be done today will have to be done in the future. For example, using soybean oil for biofuels. These things may change in the future. And we also have the Argentinian component. How do we work in an area in which you need very high capital investments? So in Santa Fe, we are organizing a consortium to develop a project like this one, of course. Other, the other challenges have to be challenged first. Forbes, a question for you. Are you looking from the farmers and researchers in South America? So, uh, so first of all, this is my first time in Argentina, and I'm really enjoying being here. Um, we've obviously, you have a very, north and south, you have a, a, a lot of dif difference in, in topography, difference in climate, difference in soils. And uh, we are looking to see what kind of uh, uh, genetics and, uh, and these potential oilseed crops that you have and whether they may be a fit uh, for our conditions in Tennessee. Uh, the genetics from further south of us in, in, in Georgia and Florida don't really work for us because of this frost issue. The genetics further north also don't work for us. So we really um, have to ha find something to fit in there. But, I think we very much want to learn I mean, farmers to farmers. I know we have a group of farmers. Uh, we had a, a short video earlier on today where farmers in Tennessee say, you know, we'd be happy to come to Argentina and learn from you. Please come to Tennessee and learn from, a, from us. So uh, I think the potential for collaboration is great. And I think you have a lot to teach us in this particular area, uh, in the, not only in the genetics, but also in the processing and how you integrate that into the other sectors of the uh, 
agricultural system. Okay, thank you. Dan, another question for you could be? <laughs> Uh, what's the difference between conventional biofuel, like ethanol, and advanced biofuels that you are talking about today? The, fu the fundamental difference is a long-standing debate all around the food versus fuel. So traditional biofuels, uh, maybe we're talking about corn-based ethanol, for example, um, always are going to displace uh, agriculture or displace the, the, the product of corn itself from providing food to providing fuel. And this, of course, is a problem because we're contributing to the increased demand for agricultural land. The, the idea behind advanced biofuels is that that, is, that problem does not exist. That we have not any food-based crops, first of all, and that secondly, with Nusit Karinata as, as the best example here, the fact that there is no land use change, it's only in rotation with existing crops, it's only on existing agricultural land, and in addition, you may in fact have negative land use change impacts, so you're improving uh, on, on having less demand for agricultural land because in addition to the oil that you're getting from the seeds, you also have the meal benefits, so that actually decreases the uh, pressure on demand for agricultural land. Okay, thank you. Eh, Verónica, one question for you. Eh, perdón, una pregunta para vos. Um, we are, the, the audience is asking whether you have looked into tax exemptions for SAF manufacturers or producers. We are looking into this because since this was declared as a theme of interest for by our governor, we are all analyzing in this new plan for this Santa Fe SAF project, we are looking and analyzing how we can help with incentives so as to play the role the government has to play when discussing new raw materials, the raw materials we need when we want to produce SAF, although the first, second. This debate of food versus fuel is a long standing one. And well, we have also had it in Argentina. What we want to do in Santa Fe is to improve land use. And in the next months, we will be working in this area. There will be a sub panel. Or we will set up in Venado Tuerto. And we weren't able to work on this because of some other issues. But Santa Fe is fully committed to this. Thank you. Thank you to all the members of the panel. Time is up, and uh, I believe we have clearly stated the opportunities in front of us in the area of biologicals, the market opportunities, the opportunities to jump onto the breadwagon of the world with specific policies coming, in this case, from a province that has been, that's always been at the head of biofuels, and how the customers want us to show how we grow crops for biofuels in a sustainable fashion, something that is sustainable in the long run from the economic and weather conditions point of view.